of today, how to make user research insights the basis of daily design decisions. Uh, what we don't, or what I don't want to cover today is actually the generation, like the, the research itself, but it's really about the insights, the analysis, and then sharing the insights at the end. Um, but in the Q&A later, if we have questions about the research itself, we can talk about that as well, of course. Um, first, a quick introduction about myself. Um, so I'm currently kind of transitioning to more of a consultant and coach role in UX. Um, the last couple of years, um, I have been working as um, head of UX for a SaaS company, and I was a team lead in an, um, yeah, a big multinational corporation. In both cases, build up uh, UX teams. Um, in both cases, UX design and user research teams. Um, one of the teams was actually super interesting because we were doing um, field research in like all across the world. We went to China, to Africa, to Thailand, even to India. Um, and we're working in the agricultural sector. And in that um, time frame, like, I was super lucky because I got to travel to all the places. Um, and we spoke with hundreds and hundreds of farmers uh, doing lots of research. And then we came to all of those problems we're talking about today, like how do you actually create long-term value out of, out of the things we've learned? Um, so that's kind of my background in the last years. Um, in, in that time, I basically, like in, in my last company, the SaaS company and uh, the engagement before, in both cases, I built up those research repositories, each time learning something and trying to improve something. Um, yeah, and I'm hoping I can share a little bit today. Apart from that, I'm just like designer at heart, heart which means I care about why. Why are things the way they are? Um, I tend to think in first principles, like really try to get to the bottom of things. And you will probably see these principles a bit in today's presentations. Uh, and yeah, if you want to connect, here you go. Um, yeah, and other than that, let's get started. So. The goal, um, the goal basically is, and I think some of you have voiced that actually in the introduction, how do we increase the return of investment of uh, user research? Um, we have more goals than that, but they're kind of goals which are under this, like increasing the value because research is time intensive, it's expensive. So how do we get more mileage out of it? How do we make it more valuable? Um, and I've realized over the last years, there's a few ways um, and they're actually dead simple. So one of them is as simple as uh, we need to increase the frequency how our research results get used. Um, more frequency means uh, like if research results get used more often, that means the value they provide should be higher. Um, second thing is make them relevant longer if they get used not just for a few weeks after you hand out the research report, but much, much longer, then you also increase the value and it continuously drives product design decisions. Um, and then the last one is if you democratize them, so it's not so much, hey, this is my research result, but if it suddenly becomes everybody's research, everybody's insights, then everybody's more engaged and because uh, everybody likes to use their own stuff. So democratize uh, research and especially the results or the user insights. Um, and all of those three combined is what really makes a huge difference. Uh, I can share a story later, what, what I've observed. Um, and yeah, let's try to explore how to get there. And then hopefully the result of all of that is that in your company, at the end, everybody loves user insights, starts developing empathy with the user uh, instead of just looking at quantitative data out of analytics and those kind of things, but certainly qualitative data about the users um, become primary uh, baseline for decision making. Um, so that's a goal I've observed once and it feels absolutely amazing when you get there because then you know, hey, we're really building the right thing. Um, so let's try to explore a couple of ways how we can get there. Um, maybe first to recap, um, what is the typical research analysis process? So as I said, I don't want to dive today into the research itself. So when you do research, you have um, the research part where you go out, you do your interviews, focus groups, usability testing, whatever it might be. Not talking about this today. If there's uh, important questions, we can cover them in the Q&A at the end. But this session is really about the 
um, analysis and sharing of the results and insights. So the typical process usually goes something like this. Um, let's say you did a user interview, you end up with a transcript. So this is a transcript and then you tag, you highlight certain areas in that transcript and you tag them. Um, and then what you end up with at the end is a bunch of highlights with all kinds of different tags, like a huge mess. And then you try to find patterns in them. So you kind of start grouping them, start sorting them, and then you go back into what was actually the highlight for each, or like the, the individual highlights for all of these groups. Um, and then from those, you basically develop themes or insights. Sometimes we call them differently. Um, so basically across all data, you first reduce it to the highlights and then you look into them and see again, okay, what are the things which are standing out? What are like three, four, five highlights combined? What is the common theme we can see in them? Um, and then the last step usually is you combine those themes which you found and package them into a report. So you end up with a handful or 10 or a dozen, or I don't know, maybe even 20 of those themes. And then you present them in a report with a big PowerPoint presentation and you hand out a long five page, 10 page, 20 page uh, PDF and so on. Um, so that's how I've often seen it, the typical process. I'm not sure if any, any of you has different experience there or if that's something that's familiar, um, feel free to, to jump in and um, share your experience there. Then if not, here's kind of a recap of that um, from a different angle. I called it flow and hierarchy of information, um, which just shows the same thing again. So you have a kind of a hierarchy of you have raw data, which is the most robust, the biggest, the biggest amount of data. And then you highlight certain amounts of the data and turn them into so-called nuggets, or like everybody calls them differently. Um, the system I'm presenting today, um, the first ones were actually developed that was, um, that was at, at WeWork uh, and they called it Polaris um, and they coined this term of nuggets because each little piece of information is like a little nugget, a little gold nugget, which is super valuable. So that's why the term comes from. Um, so yeah, that's the hierarchy of information. You have the raw data on one side, then from the raw data, you kind of try to break it up into dozens or even hundreds of tiny little nuggets of information. And then you try to condense it into those themes, which are like the common insights, the common themes you find across your entire raw data. And now on this slide, what you see, there's actually one thing missing what I presented before. Um, does anybody notice what's missing? You can just shout it out, it's all right. Is it the tagging? The tagging is kind of sort of what I tried to um, illustrate with those colorful little things. That's basically the tags. Um, the insights or the combination of the themes into insights. Yes, the combination of the themes or insights into the research report. So there is no report. Um, because like what we see here on the screen are the essential elements you have. You have raw data, you have the raw data split up into the nuggets and then you have the learnings. And by the way, I use the words themes and insights interchangeable. So for me, the themes and insights, that's always these end results you end up with, the common, common patterns you find. But what is actually not inherently required in, in this whole structure of, of information is the research report at the end. So I thought, okay, do we need it? And then I explored what are the problems with research reports. Um, here we have a couple of sample, uh, like just some screenshots of some research reports. Usually all of them are like many, many pages long and you can see there's a lot of text, they're very wordy. Um, so let's dive down, let's explore what are some of the problems of research reports. And this will bring us back to the goals and the how to I outlined at the beginning of the presentation, how we solve those problems some of you have voiced in the introduction. So problems with research reports. Um, number one, what I just said, they're too verbose. They're basically too big. There's too much in them. Um, when you get them, it's so much information at once that you can't even soak up all of it. Um, and 
it's also not all of it might be relevant at the time you get the research report. It's kind of nice to know, but if it's not relevant right now, you tend to forget it, um, especially when it's so much. And you might know other tools like which are also about knowledge or learning. Like, I don't know if some of you know Duolingo for language learning. They kind of took this tedious process of language learning and also broke it down into instead of just like, instead of having like in school, two hour sessions in one go. Duolingo, when you learn a language, you learn like five minutes a day. So they reduce it to reduce the amount of information because then it's more memorable. So research reports typically have this problem. They're just too big. So you can't memorize everything. Then another thing is they're not really actionable. Often it's PowerPoints or PDFs. So they don't really integrate in any workflow you have. When I say workflow, I mean, uh, you guys probably work in Jira, Confluence, Figma, Sketch, uh, you name it, like all those tools, Slack, all those tools which are kind of integrated with each other, which talk with each other, which we are in, in our daily work. But a research report doesn't really, doesn't really fit in there. Um, and the second problem is it can't be filtered or customized to your needs. There's usually, that goes back to the first point, there's so much information in them, um, but it's a PDF. So how do you reduce it to something which is relevant to you and to your role in the company? Um, then, yes, after a time, they just get for, uh, forgotten or sometimes they disappear in the file system. You can't find them anymore. Um, it's always this, hey, we did this research a while ago. Does anybody remember where that is? Um, like I've heard that a lot. <laughs> I'm not sure about you guys, um, but that's a typical problem when, when you have a report with PDF, uh, PDF report or something like that. Um, and yeah, therefore the problem is it's just not present. Like you see it once and then it disappears. So that's not good. Um, because we spend so much time and effort into the research and the, the results are usually super valuable. So we should treat them accordingly. So number one lesson is make the report optional. Um, the goal of research is not a report. Um, the goal of research is driving knowledge in the company. So you're not finished with the report. You're finished when everybody is actually using the insights in their daily decisions. So how do we get there? Um, no surprise. Insights repository, I believe, is a better way of doing that. Um, here on the right side um, is roughly how something like that looks like. So you basically have a list of insights, and then you have filters uh, where you can search and filter down all those insights which are generated over time to the ones you currently need for your current project. So if you work for a... Um, SaaS company and you're working on the onboarding flow, then you go into the research repository and you find the tags which are relevant for onboarding. And then you get the research insights which have been done over time around onboarding. No matter if it was yesterday or a year ago, um, you will always still find all of the information re related to your specific topic which have ever been generated. So. That's one of the key advantages of having this repository. And of course, it's just just like any other tool, like, like Figma or Notion or Confluence or Wiki, like you have one source where you can go to. Um, you don't have to search around in the file system anymore. Hey, where was this PDF? Um, you don't have to ask colleagues anymore. There's just one tool and there's everything in there. Um, so now let's explore how this works in detail. I've seen there's two questions in the chat. I unfortunately can't see the chat while presenting. Um, so if there's a question, please just uh, voice it out and I try to answer it. That's all right. So um, this is an important thing while we talk about the repository, because uh, this is kind of a criticism I've heard a few times. When we do research, is it really relevant for a long while? It is. Most research findings are based on human behavior. Um, and we as humans, we don't evolve so quickly. We don't change our behavior so quickly. So whatever we learn related to human behavior today is very likely still relevant tomorrow and next year and probably the year after. Yes, tech moves a little faster and you might have some insights which are more relevant for specific features in your product, which might change. But typically good user research um, also provides or generates a lot of generic information, which are 
relevant for a longer time. So we should make sure that this information actually stays accessible and usable for a longer time instead of being buried in a research report once. Then before we go into details, I, I just want to give you a quick idea of how some of those repositories look like. Like here's two or three different tools. All of them are basically structured the same way I showed it in the quick illustration. You have some sort of filters in this case on the left and then uh, the the themes or insights or whatever you want to call them, they call them stories um, on the right. Uh, so every product manager, every designer, literally everyone in the company can go in there, search for something they're interested in, and then they find, okay, what is all the research, all the information we have about the topic, which I care about right now. Um, this is a repository I set up back then. We didn't know about specific tools yet. So we just used Airtable. Um, I can show that in a little more detail afterwards if uh, if we want. Um, and then this is another tool which is also specific for research. I'm going to name the tools and describe the pros and cons at the end, just that you get a rough idea of how does such a tool actually look like in the end. And basically, it's always the same. You get an overview of insights and you can search them, filter them, and so on. And you can also dive deeper up the information architecture into the nuggets, into the raw data. Good, then, oh, my light just went off. So how to make the research insights more present. So when you have them in the repository, that's one thing, that's a nice thing, but that's not enough yet because they're just sitting there. Um, but to make them usable, to make people use them, we kind of have to constantly put them in their face. Um, because if you know something's just sitting there, it doesn't necessarily mean you will constantly go there and pick it up from there, right? But if somebody constantly puts new information in front of you, then you kind of develop a habit of reading it and getting excited by it. So to illustrate that, let's go back to the typical process. Uh, what I want to show here is um, a timeline, basically. So in the old world where you collect a lot of user research and then you package it in a report. I kind of want to illustrate what happens here. Um, and I will draw a line which shows when does how much value get generated for the team. Um, and under this horizontal line, we basically see the research team working, but everything they're working is only generating value once it gets published, once it, once it moves over this horizontal line. Um, so let's play this. So right now the team is working, the research team is working, they're collecting those insights. And now at the end, you've seen they package them in a report and release that report. Um, so you see a lot of time has passed where everything was kind of hidden within the research team. Um, and they only shared the stuff when they had enough to package it in a report and then they published the report. And that's of course always a big deal. Like it's a presentation, the report got sent around. So for a short amount of time, everybody talks about it. But then you can also see typically, and I think some of you have described that at the beginning, the value curve goes down again. Um, and we have discussed all the problems. Why does it go down again? It's too much. Um, it's not actionable. It's not accessible. So yes, while the report is fresh, it creates a lot of value, but then it also drops down really fast and gets for forgotten. And I believe there's a better way, which is just agile, constant research, like constantly push out information, which means instead of waiting for the report, just whenever you learn an insight, push it out there. Nothing ever happens under the line. Everything is kind of public. It requires a bit of a mindset shift within the team. So the team um, needs to understand correctly what are those insights and needs to understand, hey, the focus is on speed. So two weeks down the road, four weeks down the road, we might learn new things and those insights might change uh, a little bit or there might be an, an updated version of them. Um, but it's good. Like we do the same thing in agile software development, right? We work in iterations and there we love it because it creates value quickly. And this is the same principle uh, applied here. And then there's another benefit which we also know from agile software development. Uh, once you put something out there, people can actually talk about it. So in this case, when we when we look at the timeline, 
they didn't wait to collate all of that into a, re, uh, in a into a report, but every insight, once they have it, they push it out. And now it's out there and the team can see it. And the team might say, hey, I have a question about this first one here, which you just published. Um, there's something I don't understand. So the team can ask a question. And then it goes back to the research team and they can think about it. And then they might realize, hmm, yeah, we've forgotten something in the research. There's an angle we didn't uh, we didn't think about before, and maybe we should add that. And then they do another interview or another test or another something. They work on it. Um, and then they can actually publish this improved um, insight again. And this is something which wouldn't happen when you just realize everything at one go, because there's not enough time to discuss all of those. But now that there's that all the themes, all the insights are spread out over time, actually there's enough time to discuss each of them. Um, so with this, you kind of get an additional free value add for the research, just because you work in iterations. Yes. I actually, um, like even when, when we're designing, I often told my design teams, hey, um, what counts, what really adds value is in is not how much time you spend on something, but how many iterations you do on something. So when we design, um, I kind of say, hey, rather do uh, one iteration per day, like one draft per day for the whole week, then you have five iterations and you have five times feedback. So you have five times where you improved something instead of spending a whole week on something and only showing it at the end of the week, because then you only get feedback once. Um, so your chance of improving it is very minimal. And it's a similar principle here, actually, uh, which works with research as well. So this means, uh, in my experience, frequency beats completeness, even in research. So I rather take a little penalty in maybe the research we publish is not 100% accurate. We're doing qualitative research. When is that ever 100% accurate anyways? Um, but the, the benefits you get from working fast and publishing stuff early and repeatedly and quickly is much, much higher than that penalty you might get in terms of uh, accuracy. So, but then the question is, how do we actually create this constant flow of insights? How do we publish that to the team? In our case, that was quite simple. We had the research repository and we just interfaced it with Slack. So whenever we got nuggets in, um, they got tagged and then we pushed them to Slack. Easy, almost. Almost easy. If you do it like that, um, it probably won't work exactly that well. Um, there's two things we had to learn and had to consider. So to make this thing work, um, you need two things. Um, you really made to, need to make sure whatever you push is relevant for the person who receives it. Um, and you really need to manage noise. If you push too many insights per day, per week, um, then people will get annoyed by it. Like if it's if it's overloading, if it's too much, then people will stop reading them all together. So you kind of need to manage a little bit how much information you push out there. Um, and we did that in these two these two ways. So in our case, we had different product teams. So we're working on one product, and it was split up into three feature teams who so were working on different parts of the product. Um, so we tried to give each team the information that is relevant to them and not the information which they actually don't need to care about. So only the relevant stuff. So we did that by, you remember that from earlier, we looked at all the tags we have generated in the system. And then we said, okay, which tags are actually relevant for each team? And then we just mapped that. So we said, okay, there's a certain group of tags which is relevant for team A. So let's say team A works with, works around onboarding and uh, those kind of things. And then we looked at, okay, which tags are relevant for our second team, which was kind of the core team. And you can see there can be an overlap. So like some tags, tags might be relevant for multiple teams. Some might only be relevant for one team and so on. So if you have multiple teams, then you can kind of map out which tags are relevant for which team. And then what happens is, if a new nugget comes in, if a new insight comes in, uh, it gets tagged. And then according to the tags, it gets distributed to the teams. So now you see here's a new insight. It has a blue tag, a green tag, and an orange tag. So this means we start with the blue tag, 
the blue tag is attributed to team A. So it gets published into team A Slack channel. So each of our teams had a, had a Slack channel. Then it's tagged with a green tag. Green tag is team C. So this message also gets published into their Slack channel. And we used a simple interface there. So as I said, back then we were using Airtable, which interfaces with Slack. So in that case, you can simply push it through whenever the insert comes in, like literally real time. Um, and then you can see there's also an orange tag. So orange tag is um, attributed to team B. So this message gets pushed to team B. It's also attributed to team A, but we already sent it to team A. Um, so it's just two reasons it went to team A, we don't send it twice. Um, next message comes in has our orange and purple. Orange is for team A and team B. And then purple again, we already sent it to team B, no problem. Um, and so on. So this is one reason or one, one way of reducing noise a bit. And you can see for most teams, we started with three messages, but most teams, or like we started with three nuggets of information, but most teams only got two. So we already reduced the noise a little bit. In reality, it's even less. Like by that, you already reduce the amount of information by at least 50%, which is a good thing because you don't want to overload the teams. And then the second thing we did um, to manage noise was we introduced an, a quantifier for how important is each piece of information actually, we called it magnitude. And this is a totally subjective value. Like whoever puts in the information or whoever is the user researcher who's reviewing that snippet, that, that nugget, um, just does a personal guess out of, okay, how important is that? Is that crazy, super important and it's five star? Is it something, yeah, let's collect it, but it's probably, I'm not sure if it's relevant at all, then they give one star or somewhere in the middle. And then with that, we can also kind of filter how many messages to get sent out. So in our case, it was like, if something is one or two stars only, then we don't send it. We just want to collect it in the database because we want to have a really complete database, a really complete repository, but we don't want to spam people with stuff where we believe it's probably not important. If something wasn't rated, we also didn't send it out. So we are only send out stuff which got uh, a magnitude uh, assigned to it. Um, then yeah, um, if it had three or four stars, then we only send it out to the relevant teams. So if a tag matched a team tag, then we send it to the team channels. But then we had some stuff because we also wanted to influence the entire company to think more user-centric, uh, to develop empathy for the users. So, so whenever we had something where we thought, hey, this is like really, really super important. This is a crazy important learning, uh, super interesting learning. Then this is actually we something we sent out to the entire company in a channel where everyone was in. So it was still a dedicated user insights channel, but it was one really for everyone, not team specific. Um, and that also made a difference that like you could see over time, the, the company got more interested and more and more people joined that channel and were reading it and starting discussions. So this is really something which made a huge difference. Um, not just having this repository sitting somewhere, um, but actually um, putting this, putting these information into people's faces every day. And I think this is one part of it. Like everybody in the company and everybody in those product teams got the information when it was fresh, when it was new. Um, and you know it from the news, like nobody cares about old news. Um, so everybody wants to know what's the latest, what's the newest. Um, and that actually drove a lot of conversations and that made it more exciting to, for the entire company to kind of pee on the pulse of what's going on with our users. What are they thinking? What are their problems? Um, and that drove a lot of conversations. Um, so we had a lot of conversations going on in those Slack channels where those automated posts were made from the repository. Um, and then we did a second thing. Hello, good. Sorry, is there a question? Uh, oh. Hi, could you all please just uh, mute all your mics? Okay, then I'll just go on. Um, in case there's a question, just uh, interrupt me, please. Sure, Marcus, you can just go here. Good. And then there was a second thing we did, which was also um, surprisingly powerful um, for all of us designers. So we worked in Figma 
and we kind of, so when you work in Figma, it is an artboard where we put a wireframe or a design together. We already had a pretty good system here that we did one thing, which was next to our artboards, we kind of copied the, the user stories or the brief, the project brief, or like the, the thing we're supposed to achieve. We copied that into the Figma file so that when a designer was working on a design, um, next to the design, there was always the, okay, what is the use case we're trying to fulfill here? What are the user needs for this specific task? And what are the business goals or the business needs behind that? So you always have that in context of your design, um, which was really powerful because then your designs really solve the problem instead of over time kind of becoming nice, but sometimes going a bit away from the original problem. So that was one thing we already did. Another thing we then did with those user insights, we literally brought them into our um, design system in Figma. So we created components for all of them. So you can easily just drag them out of the component library. And without telling any one of the designers, all of them did that by themselves. I noticed how designers were collecting the relevant insights and were placing them next to the artboards so that while they were designing, they could always relate to Oh, like here are three, four, five, maybe 10 things we know about our users and which are relevant for my current project I'm working on. Um, so I just drag them out here. So they're always in front of me in my face and memorable. Um, and they really like that. That made a difference. Um, it just helps to keep the projects more on track and it helps to achieve this, what the title of the presentation says, like make user research the basis of your daily design decisions. Um, so this was, uh, and you can do all kinds of those things, but the, the key learning really is make your insights omnipresent. Think about ways how, depending on your workflow, like everybody has different workflows, but how can you include them there, um, that they're always there, especially in the situations where you need them. Like when you make design decisions, when you make product decisions, how can you include them that the user research insights are just there? Um, because then they will get used. If something is easy to use, because it's just there, um, then people will use it. So this is really key. Uh, Marcus, I had a quick question on, mm -hmm. if you. Please ask. I had a quick question uh, regarding the previous slide. So uh, you mentioned to uh, push the research, uh, incoming research in an agile manner to keep pushing them on uh, to the air table or wherever possible. But when do you actually, uh, decide to go on and work on it as a feature or an a good insight which relates to a convertible design actually uh, feel free to ignore this question answer it later if you already have it in slides written yeah so um i don't have that specific question on flat so we can answer it real quick um this was mainly um or maybe let me uh, let me uh, please remind me in like 10 minutes um because sure. then is a better time to, to answer that. Sure, go on. Yeah, sorry. No, perfect. Thanks for, thanks for asking. Um, because like this next section is actually leading to what you just asked. Um, so maybe I go through that section real quick and uh, then I can try to answer it even though it's not directly in there. So the last point I mentioned at the, at the beginning is uh, you have to democratize user research. That really makes a difference. But what does that actually mean? Um, part of it, is what kind of information does actually go into your research repository? And in my opinion, it can be almost anything. So of course you have your typical user research stuff, transcripts, uh, video recordings from interviews, those kind of things. Like whatever the user researcher is doing is kind of going in there. Um, but then you can expand that. Um, the most obvious thing customer support, like their feedback, their support requests, this kind of stuff is gold. And good researchers, good designers know that the first people you go to in a new company is customer support and ask them, so what are our users' problems? What are they talking about? What do they like? Because if anybody knows, it's customer support. Um, and this is actually something that happened in our case, and that was so powerful. So we, our customer support team, they knew about all the pain points of our users and our problems product, but they didn't get hurt. Um, kind of related to the question you just asked, like how do you try to make those insights drive product decisions? 
And those guys, our customer support guys, they were so frustrated because every month they made a presentation about here are the top things, the users request and so on and so on. And then the product managers still prioritized whatever they wanted. So the impact of customer support, even though they knew so much about the problems in our product, the impact they had was really, really minimal. Um, and I think it's kind of this, yeah, there's a report once a month, but apart from that, there's not really a lot of integration. Um, and then we set up the system um, and they really loved it. And they started pushing more and more information from customer support into the research system. Um, and with that, uh, they draw conversations. There was more and more interesting content, which was really real time because if they pushed something, it was literally a customer support request from today. If they found it interesting, they pushed it into the system, which is forwarded it. Uh, and it got put into the Slack channel for the entire company to see. So you really close the loop in real time. The entire company suddenly could see today what today's users' problems are. Like we did never have that before. Um, and that actually led to also a change in the product managers. Because suddenly they saw, hey, there's a really valuable trove of information. Um, so I noticed how they actually started spending a lot of time in, in the repository and digging around and trying to understand what's going on and what they should prioritize. So before customer support was kind of begging them, hey, this is really important. Can we please do that? Um, but the PMs, they were kind of a little stubborn and wanted to have their own way and wanted to make their own decisions. Now, customer support had a way more powerful tool that just gave them all the information, but the decisions were still the product manager's decision. Of course, customer support could influence it a little bit by which information they put in and which information they not put in. Um, but it was just so powerful because it's democratized. Everybody makes it their own. Everybody feels like, oh, this is awesome. It's just a source of information and I can draw my own conclusions from it. So it's kind of a indirect way it influenced the, the product decision making in the big picture thinking way. But then also what I showed with the Figma file on the Slack channels, it's like on your daily tiny works, like when you really, when something has been prioritized and strategized and decided already, and you now work on the feature itself, even then it's powerful because you always have access to those information. Yeah, and that's why raw data can really be anything. Um, proper user research data, customer support data is super valuable. Uh, what I find quite valuable is social media. I kind of have to take that with a grain of salt. But yeah, go on social media, find out what people talk about your competitors, about your own product, about the industry. And every now and then you can just add, add nuggets and it completes the picture because suddenly you get different perspectives on the same problem. Um, can be articles about trends, industry, like literally can be anything. Um, and this also means everyone can contribute, not just can contribute, but everybody should. That makes it really, really powerful. And then this often leads to one of the, the questions I get asked the most. How do you manage data? We, we are getting an echo from your end. Sorry, sorry to interrupt. Mark. Okay, sorry, is the echo better now? Awesome. So. A question I get asked a lot is, how do you manage data quality? Sorry, I'm living next to a hospital. You might hear the background noise right now. Um, so how do you manage data quality when actually everybody can enter anything? Um, and the answer to that is relatively simple. Um, I believe in managing the data quality through um, transparency. So if you look at these two nuggets, both of, both of them kind of tell you where the information is coming from. And then we had another thing called review. So technically what we wanted, uh, what we had was a process where user researchers were supposed to go through all the nuggets which come in and review them. Like look if the tags are correct, uh, look if it's uh, relevant at all, or like just look at, is the information credible? Does it make sense? Is it tagged correctly? Um, and then if you look at these two cards, everybody is free to decide to do with, with them whatever you want. Um, 
but of course, if you if you make a decision, and it turns out to be and somebody's like if you make a decision based on the let's say the right card on the screen, and then somebody is saying, hey, why why do you decide like that? And then you say, yeah, there is information in the in the repository, and then he's and then I'm asking, okay, so what is that information? What did you base your decision on? And then he shows me the card. And I'm like, yeah, but you know, this is just a tweet and it hasn't been reviewed and it's, have you checked other sources? Um, and then, so with that, you can have a proper discussion and see if decisions which are being made based on this data are actually made based on good data or bad data. And this is nice because it educates people to look closer at hey, uh, what is good information, what is bad information. Um, but it still allows everyone to just dig in there and find out. And uh, more often than not, actually people make smarter decisions and find out stuff we didn't know before, just because some, suddenly they can dig and uh, they, they are empowered. Uh, they can do it themselves. Um, so overall, the, the value, the gain from that is, is much, in my experience, much bigger than the risk of having data in there, which is not that great. So yeah, uh, basic principle means uh, don't limit the data entry, just ensure the quality on the output by showing the audit trail, showing the credibility and those kind of things. And then, yeah, as I said, the, I think the key learning for me was actually restarted by, hey, let's create a research repository. Uh, and over a, while, over a while, I told this story about customer support. Um, so at the beginning, they were like, hey, this is nice. Could we maybe do this? Could we maybe do that? And then after a while, I was like, hey, we need this. We need to do that. So they were making it completely their own. And I loved that. Um, so, and with that, it was actually not really a research repository anymore. It was an insights repository. And I think this little change in naming uh, makes a huge difference because research is just an action, which is owned by a department, not by everyone. But insights is something everybody in the company should own. Um, and it also broadens it and goes back to, hey, everything can be in there as long as it's insightful. Um, and this kind of also gives everybody in the company the permission to, hey, use it. Uh, put information in there, make it your own. If you have a good system and everybody can create their own views into the data and filters and, and dashboards and all those kind of things. Um, so it's insights with possibly for everyone. Yeah, and this is basically what I just said. So that was a really interesting learning. Like you can give up control um, to gain adoption. So we gave some control to customer support, uh, willing to give some to PM, to other departments. Uh, if it means everybody is suddenly using it, awesome. Because then everybody will make decisions which are user-centric and based on qualitative data, qualitative information about how it uses. Marcus, when you say give up control, you mean uh, people's, you, uh, the company's uh, power the, in different organizations to feed in into that repository, right? Yeah, so in, in our case, we were, it's very easy to say because we were a small startup, we were 50 people. Um, it's, of course, a different thing when you work with 5,000 people. Um, but the main learning was at the beginning, it was something we started in the UX department. Um, and we were the owners of it. We were deciding how the software works. We were prioritizing which uh, functionalities we put in first into the repository and what other things we probably don't do. And over time, we really <coughs> realized we get so many requests, but we have to let go a little bit. And then we have to put things in there which we might not even like from a UX perspective because it's just so powerful if this thing gets bigger. And if suddenly customer support, for example, says, hey, this is as much our tool as it is your tool because our information perfectly works together. Um, so this is what I mean with give up control. Don't hoard it. Don't don't say no, no, no. This is our research repository. You can't do this. You can't do that. We want to protect the integrity of our data. No, like find better ways to manage data quality as we've just shown, and allow everybody to make it their own because then they will really adopt it. If you give ownership, people will use it. That's the idea. And then I actually have only have one topic left before we can go to the Q&A. And this is probably the most depressing topic. What are the tools? Um, and this whole area is still very, very young. And 
I don't think there's the ideal tool out there yet, to say that up front. Um, I can show three tools. Um, there, there's a couple more, but these are probably the three most promising, most prominent ones. Uh, Dovetail and Enjoy HQ are specifically designed as research repositories. Um, Dovetail, um, they come from Australia, well-funded startup, um, really easy to use, super quick, super user-friendly. Um, what's a bit limited is the functionality, especially in terms of analysis. Um, but the benefit of Dovetail is, is clearly, it's so easy to get started. And it's also uh, what is so important for such a tool. I think literally everybody in the organization will be able to use it because it's so easy to use. Um, then there's Enjoy HQ. Um, this is kind of the flip side of it. That one has good anal analysis functionalities, uh, which are a lot more detailed and go deeper. So researchers kind of love this tool more because they can do more of the researchy stuff. Um, but I find it not as intuitive and I find the information in it quite hard to find, which kind of defeats the purpose a bit if your goal is to democratize uh, user information. And then there's Airtable, which is something we used at the beginning. Um, because we didn't really know of those tools yet. So Airtable is just a general database which you can use for anything. Um, so it's not a specific tool, but you have to set it up. So you have to set up this whole data structure um, and the permissions and everything. So that means it's of course super flexible to adapt to whatever your needs are, but it's also crazy intensive to set it up. Um, it's not the best usability then either because you would want to have a couple of specific functionalities for research tools, which that just doesn't provide. Um, so usability wise, we really struggled with that. Um, in terms of data management and all of that, it was great. Um, but usability wise, we really struggled with that. I currently lean a little more towards Dovetail because um, my priority is this democratizing information. Um, but yeah, it's it's really hard to pick a winner right now. We can actually, I can, let me exit the presentation. I can show those tools real quick. Um, I assume you still see my screen, right? Yes, Marcus, we can see your screen. Great. Um, so this was the Airtable database we used. Let me move that out of the way. Uh, we kind of see the structure just, uh, like right now we're in the inside. So these are kind of the key learnings we took out. Um, and again, you could filter up here, you could uh, search them up here to whatever to topic you have. And then the key thing here is you have an insights clarity. So this was a SaaS tool and we realized, um, so it was an online design tool actually. And we realized, hey, our users, when they design for them clarity, like having a clear design is much more important than having a beautiful design. Um, and this might be something if you work for an online design tool where a lot of people in the company might say, huh, are you sure? This is weird. Um, and the nice thing about any research repository is that you have this audit trail. So here, this is basically our summary, but that down here you see linked, where is this, like, where's this information coming from? Why do we believe that? So we linked this theme, this insight to all of the quotes we had. And then this whole thing becomes really credible. Um, I can show the same thing here in Dovetail. As I say, this is kind of the um, my favorite in terms of usability. Um, where, let me see if they, so this is a sample database. Um, yeah, you see the same principle. So you have your themes, your insights here. They call it insights. And if you click into one, you kind of can read the summary. And then you can see where is this coming from. Like you can see this is coming from three highlights from uh, two different interviews. Um, and then you could open this and get more context and see the entire interview. And the process is pretty much the same in all of the tools. So you start with the raw data um, where you have, um, you just put those notes in. Those notes can be anything, can be text. In this case, it's a, it's a, a video or text uh, audio recording. The tool creates a transcript and then you can just go in, highlight something, um, assign a tag to it, um, I don't know, like this. Um, 
And while you do that, you don't even think about how you use that at the end. You just go for all the information you have and tag it with uh, tags you think are relevant. And once you've tagged it, then you can go through your tags and you realize, okay, there seems to be a lot of problems with navigation and you open that and then you see all of the highlights which are relating to navigation. And this is kind of the moment where you realize those themes develop. So it's the same which I showed at the beginning of the presentation. And then you can say, okay, let me select this one, this one, and this one. And I think this one is relevant too. And from that, you can now create an insight based on those individual nuggets of information. So this one works here really well. What's missing a bit is sometimes the, the insights are actually in the combination of, uh, of tags. Um, and this is where this one here is a bit better, but quite frankly, I only uh, tried out the demo for a few hours and I'm still not really sure yet how to use it. Um, but in principle, it works the same. Like you have those insights and if you click on them, you should also be able to see here yeah, the quotes where it's coming from. Um, so yeah, these are the three I can recommend trying out. Um, as I said, Airtable is a lot more complex. You can see we have so many tables up here. Um, our Nuggets table is probably will take a while to load. Uh, it's super extensive. We have so much data in there. Um, yeah, I, I don't even want to go into that because it's just going to confuse us um, unless we have uh, detailed questions for that later on, just to give a quick overview of the different tools. Yeah, and with that, Q and A. Uh, yeah, Marcus, uh, I have two questions. So uh, one question is like, uh, how do we maintain the validity of these insights? So say for example, since you said we are going to maintain this as a user repository, a user insights repository, right? So the insight which you put into the repository three months back may not be valid now. So uh, how do we maintain the validity of each insights? Uh, that is my first question and second question is like uh, from the uh, my understanding is like uh, this is more of a culture uh, in the company right so we create the user repository in the first place and then the product owner or product analyst should make sure that uh, he stays on top of this uh, user repository regularly on a day to day basis so that uh, he could use it on his uh, day to day activities and also in making the product uh, decisions uh, is my understanding right yeah so um the first one is probably the uh, simpler question to answer. Um, the, actually, let me quickly end the presentation. The first one is the simpler question to answer. I actually don't think um, that the, um, as I said in the presentation, that a lot of the information becomes irrelevant so quickly. Um, it, re it depends a bit on your project. So this is where we um, might differ. So I've mostly been working in kind of innovation projects, not just in, oh, let's work on a specific feature and then we move to something else. Where of course the, the specific information you have for one feature often won't be relevant for the next different kind of feature you're working on. Um, I think my work was a bit more strategic in the last couple of years, or like also our team's works. So that a lot of the information actually stayed relevant uh, quite a long while. Um, this might also be when you, let's say you have a dedicated research team, um, talk with them and say, hey, how can we get a balance between while we're talking with people anyways, um, even though currently we're only interested in this very specific feature we're building, always slot in a few questions which are more generic, which will help us in the long run because the expensive thing is finding the people and talking with them anyways. If you talk with them 10 minutes longer or not, it doesn't really make a difference in terms of any kind of cost. Um, so whenever you talk with someone, try to get some generic high level information out of them. Um, therefore, uh, I believe a lot of information is long-term. Um, the ones which are not long-term, we still keep them in. Like we didn't put any effort into um, cleaning out the system at some point. But most of the time when we were searching something, the default sorting order was kind of by date and magnitude. Like ideally you kind of have a smart tool which combines those two. Um, 
same way Google research results work, right? Um, they, they look at what's the quality of the information, how many other pages link to, to that page, but they also look at it, how old is it? And the older it gets, the further down it goes in the search results. Um, so it's really just, um, really just don't, don't control the quality in the input or like in the database itself, control it in the output, which means while you're searching, while you're filtering, you have to take care of that. I'm like, oh, this is like two years old. Maybe I don't fully trust that anymore. And then, sorry, what was the second question again? Uh, my second question is like, uh, this the overall process, right? It would be more of a culture to the company, right? So we create the user insights repository at the one end, but it can be useful only if there is a culture where the product analyst or product manager just stays on top of the uh, user insight repository and uh, he just uh, uh, reads it day in and day out uh, so that he can use it uh, in the product decisions or whatever activities that is involved around product is my understanding, correct? Yes, so it definitely depends on what's the what's the process, what's the culture, what's the team set up, what are the responsibilities. In our case, um, so when I set this one up, I was head of UX, so I had quite a lot of weight. Um, but in general, everybody, so I was kind of lucky because in general, everybody in the company was high level convinced that we should work based on user needs. So this means we need to somehow be able to see them and understand them. Um, so getting it started was kind of the, the easy sell. Um, but then what actually made it work were the things I showed, like where people saw, hey, this is actually really helpful and it's not a lot of effort and it's just there. Like it, it's, it's not an annoying tool, which is hard to use. It's just, I see it every day in my Slack. Like the majority of the people got the information through Slack. And you, you cannot imagine how powerful that is if suddenly everybody in the company every day reads two, three, four, maybe five messages from our users, from customer support or from a research trip or whatever it is. Like over time, this accumulates to so much um, that this already is a massive, massive uh, change in making user-centric decisions. And then this also forms this habit of, oh, hold on, we have this repository. I read about it every day. So, um, if I have a question, I just go there. But yes, you definitely need someone who's responsible to maintain it. Um, so as I said, in my case, I was head of UX, so I was responsible, but then we also had a dedicated researcher um, who was really yeah, more taking care of um, yeah, talking in detail with customer support, how can we improve the, the quality coming in, what should be in, what should not be in. Um, she was doing a lot of research work, which she, of course, put in there. She was helping other teams, so she was helping the product managers and so on. When they were trying to do research, she was just helping them, facilitating them, but then also showing them how do you get it in the repository so you get the most out of it. Um, there was a lot of trial and error, like not everything worked right. Um, there was also something we tried to make clear right from the beginning to say, hey, look, um, there's no perfect solution out there. We will have to experiment a bit and we will uh, probably what we do right now a year from now we will have learned that it was not the best way um, but it's okay like we're a startup we grow and learn um, but yeah you definitely need someone who is taking responsibility and uh, yeah pushing that thing and also making sure it gets like you, you re respond to questions or requests internally of the things you would want to have or what works, what doesn't work. Sometimes it's little things like, ah, oh, there were too many messages. It was kind of spammy. So we had to dial in which messages get sent to Slack and which don't. Got it, Marcus. That was pretty much informative and what I was looking for. Thank you. Awesome. Yeah, uh, do we have other questions? Uh, hi, Marcus. Haruka here. Hi, Haruka. Uh, so I work as a UX designer for an IoT company. Uh, so we make devices uh, that work that you control with your uh, with an app, basically. Um, what I'm looking for is, I mean, uh, you know, we are a very young company and we have a very small team around 20 people, which includes the customer support, by the way. So we're just very small. And um, Rick, you know how you did mention about uh, relaying relevant information to particular channels um, uh, based on the tags that we assign to insights. Um, we don't really have as many uh, teams to relay these um, 
insights too actually so we just have um broadly two two or three teams you know that i can uh, maybe pass on information to um in that sense like you know i think it becomes important to uh, be mindful of the tags that we are creating because i think uh, right now what i see is the tags that the kind of tags that you did create um i think i would use it mostly internally in the design team itself um you know i i have the teams we do have a design android and ios so that's it and like you know we just take care of everything amongst ourselves um again like you know how do i um, keep in mind that that's that's the structure of my organization how I, uh, what would what would you say is a better way of organizing the insights or uh, creating tags that i can pass on or is there a different method in which i should relay this information that's a that's a tricky question of course without knowing uh, the full context but this is kind of where where the problem start with with this thing because every team is so different so you always kind of have to look at what are the specifics how can we figure it out and sometimes yeah. that takes a while to find out mm -hmm. um in general what we did is we had um and you could kind of see it in the slides hinted so we had um our texts were kind of two level and most of those tools, like all of those tools I showed are doing the same thing. So you yeah. do, um, how do I explain that? So we have, um, so for example, I talked a lot about the onboarding example. Um, right. Onboarding is quite a long thing. Um, you have mm -hmm. to use a sign up form, you have to, uh, explanation how the product works. You might have the upsell page in there. Um, so the way we would structure the tags is basically uh, we would say uh, we tag something with the signup form, which is under the category of onboard. So the tag would look like onboarding slash signup form, onboarding slash product tour, onboarding slash upsell, and so on. And then to make the tagging to the teams a little easier, we would simply mm -hmm. tag the group onboarding to the team who is responsible for onboarding. With that, it's easier to manage, um, mm -hmm. but that's just one way. It probably doesn't fully answer your question. Um, yeah, no, I, I also mentioned like, you know, in the middle of the talk that no process is perfect. I mean, we do have to arrive at, you know, something that works for the team probably. Yeah. Um, so it doubt but regardless, like I really draw, drew like value from um, the process itself that you just described, because uh, that's what, like, you know, um, research is always is an end like you know it's a means to an end and yeah. that's how we have seen it and that not, doesn't necessarily have to be that way it can be incorporated into the agile process as well so that's exactly yeah exactly yeah. yeah cool thanks for the session you're very welcome uh, uh does anyone have any questions if you have any questions you can type in your questions in the chat box or you can just unmute yourself and ask the question directly to marcus There is a question from Chetna. People often misinterpret collected information instances as insights or confuse nuggets with the themes. How to make sure you have defined your insight correctly? Um, I, I think like this is quite simple. And in, in our case, we kind of said this end product, those themes or insights. Um, you want to see the audit trail. So you want to see out of which nuggets or instances does this insight come from? Kind of what I showed right now in the in the example of dovetail or Airtable, where I click in and click into a um, insight, and then it shows me, oh, this comes from these three quotes. Um, so if you have that, then you can be sure hey, this is an insight. If it doesn't have any audit trail, um, then it's like, where is it coming from? Why why is this an insight? And is it only based on one data point that it's probably not an insight yet? So this is kind of a simple rule to make sure insights or themes must always be based on multiple points of information. And there should be the audit trail that you actually see which one, like which uh, data points is it coming from? Because then you can question it, then you can discuss it and say, mm, I think you drew the wrong conclusion here. 
And then it's a very objective discussion because everybody can kind of see the raw information which led to the formation of the insight. Thanks, Margaret. Sorry, I didn't understand that. Oh, she's thanking you for answering the question. Okay, perfect. Thank you. So if anyone has any question, they can, uh, yeah. Uh, Marcus, I agree here. So I just want to, uh, this may be another tough question, but uh, I just want to understand, like, how do you bring up this culture and do this initial setup? Like, uh, say, for example, if you're a startup and uh, you have very few people, or else uh, if you're an MNC, right? So uh, there is a considerable amount of work involved here. And uh, how do we uh, get the ROA of setting this uh, repository and uh, making uh, sure that we are uh, delivering value out of doing this activity actually like? Mm -hmm. um, again, this will depend on your organization you're working in. Um, often in bigger conversations, it kind of helps to speak the language of whoever needs to be convinced which very often is the business side. Um, so if you speak of long-term ROI, getting more bang for the buck, uh, that's kind of, then you're on the right track because uh, that's what they like to hear. But then it depends uh, like how far is the organization? Um, is there already a research practice and you only want to convince to invest into a repository? So then you basically, then they already know the value of research. And then you only need to explain, hey, we can increase this value. And like all the points are in the presentation with this. Uh, right now we're doing research reports and they're only valuable short time. But if we have a repository, then we actually get multiple uses out of each insight we generate, which means there's a much higher return of investment um, from the research. And this should be something which actually can convince them. The good thing is actually it, uh, in the long run, it can even uh, reduce costs. So one thing, for example, in that company where I set this up, what they were doing, the PMs, whenever they started a project, they went out and did new research. For every project, they went out and did research. Of course, there was not a lot of budget for that. So each of the research they did was a bit mm, iffy because they really had to work with a really tiny budget. Um, but still, it cost money. It cost a lot of time. It really slowed them down. Um, and if you have this research repository, um, over time, you will actually have to do less and less research because you have a baseline information about your customers. Um, and unless your product changes drastically or your industry changes drastically, unless a pandemic happens, then a lot of things are changing. But usually, um, a lot of the information you generate will stay relevant. So then when a new project comes up, they can take 30%, 50%, maybe 70, 80% of the information they need from the repository and only have to do research for the remaining bits, which saves costs. So often these are kind of good arguments to convince stakeholders because it's not like, like you talk money, you don't talk things which they don't really know how to quantify. You're literally talking money, which is their thing. Um, so that's, yeah, how do you get the budget for it? How do you convince people to, to have it? If that was the question. If the question is more around, how do I actually employ it in the entire organization so that everybody is uh, getting excited about it? Um, then yeah, that's kind of a bigger question. But in our case, it was literally this, uh, it, it's really so fun to be able to be on the pulse and see every day um what our customers are saying but again this depends on the product maybe you don't have a product where you get daily customer support requests which lead to daily information got it margus and one more uh, follow-up question i have is like uh, is this something like it's more suitable for b2c than b2b uh, do you see anything of that sort like uh, it's more suitable for uh, uh, a b2c product than a b2b product or uh, you advise it for both i would so i think you get more value out of it the more um like the higher free on a higher frequency of touch points with your customers you will get more value out of it um 
like the more interaction your company has with customers, your customer support, your sales team, your marketing team has with customers, the more data points you generate, which you can turn into insights, into knowledge. So you can do a lot of loops, which can influence product development, which can lead to proper competitive advantage. Like if you're so close to the pulse of what's happening, um, then this is like, this is a serious competitive advantage for product to prioritize accordingly, um, act quickly to user needs and all of that. Um, some businesses are a bit different, like where they don't even work for the end customers who are using the product, but there's intermediaries in those, um, or like there's B2B businesses who don't have a huge quantity of customers, like where, where you might only have a handful of customers and then each customer has massive contract, which keeps your business alive. Um, then I think the value of it is a bit, a bit lower. Um, but I think, I still think it's, um, it's uh, beneficial to do it um, because you just keep this long-term memory. Got it, uh, Marcus. Thank you for the answer. You're welcome. Hey, Marcus. Uh, Abhishek here. Uh, firstly, um, I would like to say that um, the topic that you uh, talked about today is something which was very, very new to me. And it's an amazing way to think. It's, it's a completely innovative way to think about research and research documentation. And it was presented beautifully as well. So thank you very much for that. Um, so I'm currently uh, working uh, with a team in a consumer healthcare space, consumer healthcare startup. Um, so typically, uh, the kind of problems uh, that we have, um, the kind of work that the research team focuses on is uh, majorly on two lines. One is figuring out what is the right thing to build. And the other would be that some part of research bandwidth is spent on uh, figuring out that what we have built, was it built in the right way or not? So I think um, for the, uh, the, the information, the insight nuggets that you presented fit well in the former scenario, right? Where the marketing team or the product team is trying to figure out what is the right thing to build by talking to the market, the consumers. But do you think this format, how does it fit in the latter part where, you know, mostly it's usability testing, where we go to the consumers and see whether we have built it in the right way or not? Does it fit in, uh, into this space as well? Yeah, I'll be saying, first of all, thanks a lot. Um, nice to hear. Um, and I think you kind of have analyzed that pretty pretty right already um it's it's of course better for the strategic space because this is where um like this ties ties back to what i said in the presentation a lot of the products we build are based on human behavior which doesn't change so often but when we talk about usability testing it's like you have certain usability in your app and you fix it and then it's done and then you don't really need that information anymore so right. if if this is the yeah, but for me, this is not really research, actually. This is literally just usability testing. Um, you might be able to spot some general patterns, like you tested feature A, and there's a certain like high-level pattern which performed better than another one, and then you kind of observe the same thing in the next feature you usability tested. Then you can kind of say, ah, I, I see a theme developing there. Let's put that in the repository. So in future, we know that users pre prefer a certain way of doing certain things. Um, but I think, um, yes, you're right that a lot of the, like a lot of the information you generate in usability testing is rather short term. That's good. Thank you, Marcus. You're welcome. Do we have any more questions? You can simply unmute yourself and ask the question. I don't have a question per se, but Marcus, can you share the slides later? <laughs> yes, of course. I actually uploaded them. Uh, I can... don't need to pressure you. If you share in general, then it's okay. Yeah. I can share the link here. OK, 
Okay, uh, I had just one uh, question. It's like a late epiphany. <laughs> so, um, uh, again, uh, amazing session, Marcus. Thank you so much. Uh, great insights. Uh, I've taken like lots of notes. Maybe write a blog once as well. Uh, I'm Krishna from Hello Means. So, uh, my question was that. Uh, so we've almost like automated through the system that you've shown. Uh, we've automated the distribution of insights through the tools that you've mentioned. Now. Uh, the feeding of the user insights has to always be manual uh, by a uh, by a representative who really knows um, like who has the authority on the knowledge or do you think it can also be automated by at some point i think it can to some degree be automated uh, in the future probably more and more um, so we already have so there's two parts to it. Um, first of all, you can create all kinds of integrations. Um, customer support, again, is a brilliant example. So let's say you use Sendesk or Intercom or whatever it is in customer support, and then you can kind of have the support request, like the, the finished support request, or like any support requests which come in automatically feed into the repository. So that's step one. But at this point, the information is not valuable yet. It only gets valuable when you actually tag it because only through the text, you can find it later. I mean, yes, you can use full text search, but a lot of the power is actually that you categorize the information which comes in. Um, that is a huge part which creates the value. And this is currently, I think, still the bottleneck where a human needs to be there and tag those things. Um, but that means you can semi-automate it. Like you don't have to do manual copy and paste. That's also not what we did. Um, we also actually um, started syncing like customer support. They already had certain tags. Product management had certain tags. So we realized across the company, everybody was creating their own tagging system. Um, and we all, almost started creating kind of a, okay, let's unify it. Like how do we actually name, like even simple things, like how do we name features and how do we categorize them into which feature is a sub feature of another feature. Um, so this is something we started harmonizing so that information can flow automatically across tools. Um, and yeah, you can automatically get the raw information over so you don't do copy and paste. And then just once a day or once every few days, somebody is going through this whole list of untagged things and is tagging them. Um, and then suddenly the information becomes more, more valuable. And maybe in the future, there's even AI tools who can, uh, or maybe it's there already, I don't know who can suggest certain tags and then you just have a human who's like, yeah, this is right on no, here you got it wrong. Um, but yeah, there's a, there's a lot of things which you can automate already to some degree. And I'm pretty sure there will come a lot more um, going forward. Well, that's an amazing answer. Thank you so much. Really good questions from all of you. Thank you so much, Marcus, for sharing the presentation with us. And also, it was a very uh, insightful meetup. Uh, does anyone have any questions? If not, you can also reach out um, and ask questions on LinkedIn, Instagram, and so on. Um, I can actually put up that slide one more. Um, sure. Like if some, some, sometimes something comes up a day later or something. So feel free to connect. or you have it in the presentation, I put the link in the chat. Great, so it was an amazing uh, presentation. It was very insightful. So a lot of you joined after we introduced Hello Meets. So um, we are a startup community bringing experts to share their latest actionable insights with you over the live meetups. So we'll wrap up the uh, meetup now. Thank you so much, Marcus, and all of you for spending the evening with us. We really enjoyed the, uh, the meetup. But before we end, it would be really helpful for us and Marcus if you would you know, give a feedback session and key takeaways. You can uh, just say that what you liked about the event and any kind of feedback is appreciated. We would love to see your key feedbacks on social media. Thank you so much again. Thank you.